Welcome to Experience Life Today. I'm Ruben E. Goff. Good to be with you here on this Sunday morning. I pray that you are ready to rejoice, get glad in this day. It's the day the Lord has made, and I know the Lord is going to bless us here today. He does every day. But I know on this message today, i got to share this with you right off the bat. You might be a Pharisee if, now this is what the title of this message is, you might be a Pharisee if, and we're going to get down through a list. It really hinged off, do you remember, and I know many of you do, the fellow by the name of Jeff Foxworthy had started this back some years back. Do you remember this? You might be a redneck if, and uh, you mow your grass and find a car. Do you remember some of this stuff? And, <laughs> and he made a killing off of that, pardon the expression, but uh, he would just get down through it, you know, mowing your grass, you find a car, you do this, do that. You might be a redneck. Well, I use this in a different way. You might be a Pharisee if. And we're, you're just, the things that we learn on this will do a little personal inventory and making sure we're not falling into the entrapment of, of a, of a self-religious kind of spirit and apart from that of the real nature of Jesus Christ. And that's what this is all about today. So you want to stay tuned for this. I want to share with you just out, and actually this coming week, Hopefully this is going to be available and uh, little booklet, little books I write is only about 50 pages. This is less than 50 pages and it's called Avoiding Relationship Mayhem. And this book, a very short but concise to the point, a uh, lot of pointers in it. I do a lot of uh, headings like little numbering or whatever and things I just describe under it, give descriptions and things and pointers. And, but I think it's really going to be a good little booklet for you and maybe hand it out and give it to others who may be facing those things. I'll just read to you some of the chapters. Chapter 1, Avoiding Relationship Mayhem. Chapter 2, Pitfalls, Traps, and Misconceptions. Number 3, Things That Reveal Character. And uh, I like that chapter myself. Chapter 4, Trust is the backbone of our relationship. You don't have trust. You don't have really much of a relationship at all. And then last but not least, chapter 5, Scriptures to Strengthen relationships. And just a little book, uh, I think we're just going to really for this, probably only going to be charged around five bucks for it. And uh, pretty sure of that actually, but less than 50 pages, right to the point. And uh, we're going to make it available. You'll be able to go on Amazon or through us, one or the other, and be able to purchase this little book. The third book I've done, got a fourth one's going to be coming out after this one, Lord willing, on maturity, basically called, Would You Please Grow Up? <laughs> there you are. You can, well, I'm not even going to tell you, you can give that too. I, you're already thinking, boy, I know who that is. Well, stick around. Let's experience life here today. Happy to be in church. Yes. Aren't you glad you're not at Walmart? <laughs> huh? Yeah. Ah, this is, boy, this is, you, you don't, <laughs> you can buy chicken at Walmart, but you won't get the word there. Amen. How about that? Woo, man, I'll tell you what, it's exciting to be alive. Like I always say, but it'd be better when we're gone. Amen. It will even get better when we get over on the other side, but let's go ahead and enjoy it now. And I think we can enjoy life right now. Amen. Oh boy. Lord, help me. Help me get started tonight. <clears throat> I need you to pray for me tonight. Need you to, need you to pray that we get this out. You know, I, I make outlines up, we scribble all over the place, but you know, once the message starts, where we end up is anybody's guess. And so we just want to follow the anointing and the leading of the Spirit. And I know that God, every time He speaks, He speaks right to us. He's not talking to the church down the street. He's talking to us, amen, and everybody that's watching out there. And so are you ready for the Word? Yeah. All right. I'll say it one more. Are you ready for the Word? Yeah. All right. Let's turn, of course, in your Bibles. We're not using any of the books. So let's turn to Matthew chapter 23, ministered this a week ago. Oh, matter of fact, well, exactly one week ago is uh, on, on, out in Indiana with uh, Pam and Jim and Laura was out there with us. And uh, my, what a time we had. And, uh, but the Lord spoke to my heart. I shared this on Wednesday night. And, uh, but I tell you, as I meditated it on the other day, uh, I don't know, it was Friday and yesterday, and I was sitting at the home office desk and I was there and I just 
praying and, and sat down and I said, Lord, uh, I, you know, I just, I think I know I had three messages. I worked on three messages yesterday simultaneously. And you talk about multitasking. I cannot multitask. I almost wrecked today because I can't multitask. I was looking at a guy's helmet who had a mohawk and had squeezed it together. And uh, you ever see that on these motorcycle helmets? And I got so enthralled with his hairdo that I almost smashed the back end of a car in front of us and Lacey was gasping and I knew that gasp and I hit the brakes and we about floor, I mean, right in front of Taco Bell in Green Castle, it was pretty bad, all right? And, and Lacey understands I can't do two things at once, but when the Holy Ghost gets involved, for some reason, <laughs> I can work on three at one time, so I know it's the Holy Ghost, it ain't me, amen? So as I'm, as I'm working on this, I prayed, sat down, said, Lord, I just need your leading in all of this. And right in front was a paper folded and it was the paper I scribbled on one week ago on the spirit of a Pharisee and, and God began to deal with me about some things again. And I want you to look at Matthew 23 where he deals with the Pharisee and because I want you to understand as we said this morning, interviewers won't be lost because they're going to see this in succession almost like a part two. And, and we learned about the cross this morning being the gateway, giving us access, all that it declares over our life. I'm not going to be redundant, not going to go back through and regurgitate all of that again. But, but the cross is, is really on the other side of this cross. Right here there's a change in our life. On the other side of the cross is a brand new powerful life that can be lived and exemplified and, and, and just lived in the power of God. And however, you know that that is why the devil always tries to intercept people from making it to the cross to have their sins absolved and get released and get, find true freedom. This is why the devil will throw everything in a sinner's path to divert them from showing up on church on Sunday morning. Can you say amen? This is why that it seems like when you're praying for a lost soul and they seem like they get within inches of letting go of their sin and coming to the blood of the lamb and at that moment something detours them. It looks like they regress, digress and what it is, the devil is fighting tooth and toenail. And you know, if you're not careful, he will even slip in a substitute for worship and salvation and make people feel good that as long as they're doing good things, they're achieving some sort of standard of righteousness. But the Bible says that our righteousness is as filthy rags, that nothing that I do can achieve the grace of God and what it can do for my life. Can somebody say amen? And so... I I, there's nothing. I can't work this up. I can't gr crawl across a broken glass and cut myself and bleed out and hang myself on a cross and beat my breast and beat my head and do all and say, well, I'm trying to achieve something. I can go to church seven days a week. I mean, every night of the week, I can throw money in the offering plate. I can wave at God and, and I can sing amazing grace. I can go through all of the regimens of religiosity and still lose my soul if I don't come to the cross and believe in what Christ did for my life. Are you hearing me now? You see, this is a powerful life. We have undersold this and just indulge me to kind of build this. We have really undersold and devalued and, and cheapened the experience of salvation. I want to tell you, this is not a cheap experience. This was not a cheap incident. There's no, there's no imitation for this. When Christ bled out on the cross and what that facilitated was the most powerful event in all of the 6,000 human history in this world. Can you say amen? And I want to tell you that when a person comes to that cross, it isn't a half-hearted experience. It isn't just a little bit of a, a shuck and a jive. It isn't just a little in, a little out, a toe in, a foot out. Honey, I want to tell you when somebody truly gets saved, it should be so radical of a change that it leaves no mistake in your mind that person really found God. I shouldn't have to question when I see somebody says, oh, I'm a Christian. It should never be a doubt in my mind whether they're saved or not. If I've got, let me tell you, I should so live my life, it erases all questions in your mind who I'm serving and who I'm not. 
Nobody, I shouldn't walk down food line aisle and somebody say, well, I, yeah, he's a pastor, he's a Christian, but boy, I don't know. I, I just don't know. There's some, no, sir, they ought to be able to look at our life and say, boy, I tell you, it must be the Lord because it can't be anything else. Amen. Oh, glory to God. You see, but see, when you get into this Matthew 23, Jesus pulls the string and a plug on these Pharisees. And what is interesting, you say, why are we here? I'm going to worship, but I don't know if I can get there tonight or not because the cross opens up what it means to really worship God. I hope I can get there tonight in, in just a little while. But before I do, we got to understand the devil will try to cheapen the experience that we're experiencing tonight. He will always try to bring a substitute in. And if we're not careful, we can fall back into a self-righteousness to where we get some sort of glee and joy over who we are and what we're doing. And the next thing you know, we'll start gaining pride and looking down on people and become judgmental and critical instead of exuding the compassion of Christ to other people. And I shared that this morning, that, that I had to be careful some years back the Lord began to deal with me in prayer this week. He said, do you realize what was going on? And after I was saved and, and come forth and several years later, but then there was, it seemed like I started to fall into a self-righteousness to the point of I was happy about just being who I was and, and, and living the way I was. And, and the next thing you know, I started looking at people a little bit differently and a little bit more critically. And somebody had a problem. I didn't go into it with compassion. I came into it with my dear old bald bad and boy I was ready to knock somebody out. I'm telling you what do you mean somebody committed a sin I'm ready to tear it up and sweep it out and I mean beat them down do whatever the case cut their legs off and keep smiling but I want to tell you something the Lord reminded me he said it could have been, been as easily it could have been you walking through that door you're struggling you're having a problem and what you didn't need was a ball bat what you needed was a hand of love and said come here I can help you to the cross and get you absolved and get Get you struggle free. Can somebody say amen? I, I didn't say, I didn't say excuse sin, but there's an attitude on how to approach it in people's lives. You know, you see a drunk going down the street, you know. Oh, look at that, look at that dumb idiot, you know. Yes, it's dumb and it's being idiotic. But I want to tell you something. That drunk doesn't need to hear how dumb and idiotic he is. What he needs to hear is there's a cross that still bleeds that can break that addiction in his life and draw him out of the pit of despair and change him forever. You see, that's what we need today in Christianity. You see, in, I'm trying to get here and I can't hardly. But you, over here in Matthew, the spirit of a Pharisee, you've got to be careful of the spirit of a Pharisee. I got to thinking about this, and, and pardon me for going back to this. I actually said, I got it here in my notes, you might be a Pharisee if... You know what I thought of years back? How many remembers the fellow say you might be a red, redneck if? Somebody, oh, I don't know what you're talking. Oh, come on. You might be, you remember that. You might be a redneck if you ever cut your grass and find your car. You ever hear some of this stuff? You know, you, you might be a redneck. He said one time, you might be a redneck if you ever used a weed, eat, weed eater indoors. Now, that is getting bad when grass is just as high inside the living room. And he also said, you know what? You might be a redneck if you come home from the garbage dump with more than you went with. I, I believe that's a redneck, don't you? I, I like this one as well. He said, you know, you might be a redneck. He said, if in your above ground pool, you go fishing and actually catch fish in your above ground pool. I said, I think that is kind of a redneck. But you know, I'm not talking about rednecks tonight. I, I, I'm, I'm talking about you, you might be a Pharisee. You might be a Pharisee if you love your religion more than you love Jesus Christ. Oh, that can't be. Oh, wait a minute. I want to tell you something, folks. That has seized America and its denominations. It has so seized America to the point where people today is as more of an allegiance to their denomination than they do literally to the person of Jesus Christ. 
when you ask people what the Bible says, well, it's what my denomination says. What about the person of Jesus? I used the illustration. I sent it out in the Midwest just a week ago, and it was interesting. My brother encountered, encountered this with the number one Pentecostal denomination in the entire world. He showed them, and I, it's no big deal. They can't do anything to me. I'm independent. So I can say what I want, and the presbyter can't come. Well, anyhow, uh, but you see, but you see, he, he was there, and he, and he was called on the carpet, and all he was doing, I can tell you what he was doing. He was preaching. He was preaching to his people in that congregation, he was preaching that it was God's will to heal if you would simply believe. I read that in the Bible. This denomination used to believe that. Don't mistake it. They used to believe it, but now they changed their doctrinal stance some years ago. Well, it's been a good while. And they began to say that, uh, that God, if he desires to, if he wills to, well, he'll heal it and this and that. And they didn't like it that my brother was getting stronger and stronger in faith. And he was trying to get that instilled in the people. And they called him on the carpet. And he went to the press, or the press were called an email, major uh, overseer, and went into his office, sat down, and the man said to him, said, look, Darrell, he said, uh, you know, uh, this is not our doctrine, this and that. And my brother, he didn't argue. He just pulled out the Bible. He said, here it is, chapter and verse. This is what I'm preaching. And listen, this is what he said. Honest, the presbyter looked at him in the eyes and said, I don't care what it says. This is our doctrinal stance. And I tell you right there, I, that went through me like a knife when he shared that with me some years ago. And that's telling me we're more in love with our denomination than we are the person of Christ. And that means when we're preaching then in that denomination, we're not bringing them to Christ. We're bringing them to our little organization. This is not about drawing people to an organization. This is bringing people to Jesus Christ in him alone. You, you, well, you know, you, you, you love your religion more than Christ. I, I mean, it, it's amazing to me, but here in these Pharisees, and uh, I started here in verse 30, 13, you, you know what's interesting? These Pharisees, don't, they were not pagans, so to speak. They were not heathen, so to speak. These were not people living somewhere in, in the jungles of somewhere in some continent somewhere who'd never heard about God or, or, or went through seances and smoke and, and, and witch doctoring toy. But they, they, they wouldn't, they, that's not them. The Pharisees and the scribes were the doctors of the law. These men had their Bible, the Old Testament at that time. They had the Torah and books thereafter. And they were the guardians of the word of God. These were the preachers and the dispensers of God's word. <laughs> now I want you to hear this. They were the religious of the day in Jewry. And now that tells me that, uh, but, but the Pharisees loved their religion, but they didn't love Jesus Christ. Now, I just want to get into this. Look at verse 13. Look what he says. But woe, unto, as I said a week ago, woe there isn't saying woe to a horse. <laughs> woe here is judgment and a damnation. It is a, it is a word of stern warning. You better turn or you will burn. This is a fact. But woe unto you who scribes, as doctors of the law. They were the keepers of the word, and they were also the transcribers and etc. and the copyists and scribes and Pharisees. And this one, Jesus wasn't politically correct. Oh, I hate political correctness. You know why? Because it is enslaving us. You don't say that. Somebody will offend you. This is why we're becoming weaker and weaker. Nobody's getting developed. You know, you, you imagine this. Uh, if I never face any resistance, I'll never grow. People need to get used to it. It's called life. People's going to say things you don't like. Sometimes they'll say things that, that'll hurt. But praise, you have Christ, go get over it. <laughs> oh, I can't stand it. I just, I just can't. But he says, hypocrites. <gasps> Jesus said that. Well, Jesus went worse than that at other places. Did you know that? He even called them vipers and snakes. He even, he even called Herod a fox. That wasn't looking at some chicky girl walking down the street. That, in that time, that was a word of contempt. 
It, it wasn't nice. When you said that fox, you really meant something when you said that. And Jesus, he wasn't politically correct. He said hypocrites. And look what he says. He said, for you shut up the kingdom of heaven against men. For neither go in yourself, ye neither go in yourself, neither suffer, permit you them that are entering to go in. The, the, listen, listen to this. Here is the Bible men of the day who are not permitting people to get to the person of Christ. They are standing in front of the cross, so to speak, in front of Christ, diverting people away from freedom. It was a political takeover of God's Word. They made money off of it. Well, I even, this isn't even the notes. It ain't costing you a penny here tonight. You see, th this is what's happening today as well. You see, they politicized the Word, and they actually made it a lifestyle of extorting the people under the name of God. Oh, I get torqued. I, I, I get this thing. You know something, folks, and it is something. A lie is taking a truth and bending it, Right? It's shredded with a little bit of truth in the rest of life. You know it. We preach here in ministry. You believe it. You read the Bible. I believe in sowing and reaping. You do too, right? I'm talking even financially. I believe you can sow financially in the kingdom and you will reap out of that. But my goodness, what is wrong with the, the, the people who support ministries that fleece people just to make themselves some sort of wealthy at the expense of people's trust. You know, I'm, I'm sorry. I, I, mean, I believe it. I believe in kingdom wealth. I believe, but I believe it for a certain reason. Kingdom wealth is to have wealth in the kingdom of God to win souls and make it an opportunity to expand in the church and out and winning the lost. You know, I read this, and please don't, don't fall out with me, but when I read of evangelists, <laughs> no kidding, have five, not one, two, three, but have five, five multi-million Lear jets. Honey, you can only ride in one jet at a time. <laughs> and then get on television <laughs> begging for more because we've got an orphanage that needs money. This is what I'd like to use on a few of them, okay? I'm, I'm sorry. It's just, it's just not right. I, I believe in kingdom wealth. We believe, but see, they, they divert it. And so this is what is happening here. And he said, look, you're not permitting people to get to freedom. What do you mean by that? You see, we have to understand that in the Old Testament, see, they, they, they misconstrued things. They, they misunderstood some things. And I think they did it on purpose. See, when the Lord brought in Exodus 20 and Deuteronomy 5, he brought the Ten Commandments. He brought the law and he brought it forth. Listen, the law did what? I wrote it down here even this afternoon. The law, the same God that gave the law is the same God who gave the blueprint for the tabernacle. Are we with me? You say, well, well, what's the big deal? I'll tell you what the big deal is. The same God that gave the law and the law came and it condemned the human race. Am I right? It condemned us. It proved that we were lost and undone and sinners in need of a Savior. But you see, God didn't just bring the law. He also told Moses, I want you to build a tabernacle and there's a place in there called the holiest of holies. You see what the law did. The law, basically, it was the evidence that put them in us in prison. But listen, but the, the tabernacle sat right in the center of Israel in the middle of all of this law and yet the tabernacle provided the way of escape out of the condemnation of the law. And the, and the Pharisees should have known this that the law was not the end game of keeping people in prison and politicizing it for material gain. They should have told people, listen, the law condemned us but there was blood that was put on the mercy seat that was there as a way of escape so that we could spring free in the coming Lamb of Jesus Christ and they should have been sitting there waiting on the Messiah. But you know what the Pharisees and the scribes did when Jesus arrived? They stood there with that and said, look, they stood up and said, we got this and they blocked the way out and they wouldn't let anybody into the tabernacle basically. They would not let Christ bring forth that salvation. That's amazing to me when we can love our religion more than we love Jesus Christ. I will tell you, how do you know that you're a Pharisee? One sign is that if you're faithful even to church and faithful in giving is all good things. But if you never talk to him the rest of the week, you might be a Pharisee. 
if we're more faithful in what we're doing, but we're not faithful in communicating with and having relationship with the person of Christ, possibly we have fallen into self-righteousness. I need to talk to Jesus. <laughs> oh, I tell you. Where are we at here? Forget where we're at. All right, 24. Look at, look at 24. Boy, here, you might be a Pharisee. You see, they were religious, but they were lost. And here's another thing, too. They, they were, I'll get to that in a moment. Look at this. Ye blind guides, which strain in a gnat and swallow a camel. Boy, this is a sign of a Pharisee. <laughs> Isn't it amazing when Pharisees got together they would make a mountain out of a molehill and yet let something as big as a camel walk by and never even think twice about it. See, Phariseeism is alive and well in the church today. Phariseeism is, is <laughs> they'll look and they're critical of every little thing, little things. Matter of fact, they can hardly worship if there's just a little wee thing out of kilter during the service. Or they look over and see somebody and say, oh my. And they don't look the way they think they should look and this and that. And that just disrupts. But yet that same person can go out and lie, <laughs> cheat on their job, do all of these things and not even paying attention to that, but be very minuscule on every little other things. It's called straining at gnats and swallowing camels. Pharisees was good at that. Isn't it something the Pharisees said? They, they, see, they would add to the law. And they said, well, you can't go more than a mile on the Sabbath day. Uh, God really didn't say that. But they said, no, you can't go any further than a mile. And that's breaking the rule. And you'll have to pay for that. So you have to stay within that mile. And they said, boy, you can't break it. Boy, if you broke that, whoo. You was almost excommunicated. Yeah, that was major. You went, I went, well, how far did you go? Well, I went a mile and one ten. Oh. <laughs> Boy, you're out. Boy, you are about, oh. For the whole week, you were gossiped about. Yet these same men could bring false charges and condemn an innocent man to die and sleep like a baby at night. It's amazing to me in the modern church, the same thing goes on. And they'll get, people will get upset over the little things. And I hound on this, and, but, but it's just it's the only thing I can think of. And, and, you know, sometimes people will get upset at the littlest things. He or she didn't shake my hand. And they almost have a meltdown. It ruins them for three days. They got to get back to Wednesday night before they can even get any encouragement. And they're just about done. Sunday about done. They didn't shake my hand. And yet for three days, treat people like dirt. I've known people who got mad at me because I didn't show up when they thought I should have showed up and yet had no problem telling lies. Boy, it's getting quieter and quieter in here. Isn't it something how we hold other people to a certain standard, but we don't hold ourselves to the same? <laughs> you might be a, I mean a Pharisee. I, I did that on purpose. Look at 27 through 28. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like unto whited sepulchers. Boy, this is one which indeed appear beautiful outward, but are within full of dead men's bones and of all uncleanness. Even so, ye also outwardly appear righteous unto men, but within you are full of hypocrisy and iniquity. I don't care how pretty, I, I'm going to tell you something. You can stick lipstick on a pig. You can put eyeliner on that pig. You can dump a gallon of Armani cologne on that, on that pig. And you know what? I'm telling you on the outside, that thing is going to look nice for about five minutes. But you know what that pig's going to do? It's going to go right back. As soon as you let it go back in that barnyard, it's going right back in there, and it's going to wallow like a pig always does. Amen? Honey, you can dress it up on the outside. That is not it. You've got to get the inside changed. Come on now. You've got to get the inside. I, I know it. There's Pharisees today uh, that uh, even today, they'll, they'll center on the outside. Forget it starts in the inside. I believe in a holy way of looking. And I do believe that it ought to be, uh, we should not dress provocative and we should not uh, dress uh, like Hollywood and, and act like Paris and, uh, and, uh, and Katie, and uh, not this Katie, but Katy Perry and everybody else. 
Uh, this one's all right, okay? <laughs> but Katy Perry and everybody else, and, and, and we, that's not who we imitate. I do believe we should look different than Angelina and, and be a little different than Brad. I, I just, I do believe that. However, I, I, can, I can dress different, but still not change. The inside needs to change. That's where it needs to originate at. And this is the problem with the Pharisees here is that they were on the outside. They looked righteous. They did. They even appeared beautiful on the outside. But inside, they were just full of sin. You see, the, the Pharisee was good at converting people to religion, but not to Christ. They were real good at that. They, they would convert people to a religion. They, they would go all over and proselyte people and make them a part of that religion, but they were not leading them to Christ. It's a difference there. As I said a week ago, they were good, and I'm not going to that message tonight, but they were good at making monuments and, 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 and good, as you see here um, in verse 29. It, he said, because you build the tombs of the prophets and garnish or decorate, is the word garnish, you dress up and garnish and decorate the sepulchers of the righteous. They were good at making monuments and they were good at maintaining museums of past religious moves and powerful men and women of God. They, you know, we have to be careful of that even in the church today. And, and I keep reminding myself about it. It's wonderful to look back to the past, but we don't live back there. That well is dried up. It's over. But today we're living in a present. It ought to invigorate us. When, when we look at Azusa Strait, when we look at the Welsh Revival, when we look at the move in the mid-1800s, when we look at the, uh, the Reformations and all of this stuff and, and the revivals of history and even into the 1700s here in America as well, I mean, it's wonderful. But, you know, we, we're so busy. We'll, we, we'll build a monument to that and say, well, this is what it used to be like. This is what it has what, or has been and, and this is the way it used to be. And we'll get so caught up in what used to happen. There used to be healings. There used to be salvations. There used to be moves of God. And there used to be this and used to be that. I'm tired of used to. God is still alive and well. He's not the God of the dead. He is still the God of the living. He, Jesus said, my God, my father is still the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And they're alive. They're not dead, honey. We need it today. And I believe it's coming and it's happening. I, I believe it is materializing in a very wonderful way. You know, these Pharisees couldn't recognize Christ or an ordained move of God. You know, that's the same way today. Pharisees today have taken over the church so bad throughout denominations and throughout the whole political machine work of it that I tell you, when God does try to move, they don't recognize it and they shut it down because they have it in their mind, this is exactly how he'll move. Maybe not. There are times during a revival, you'll see things you've never seen before. Boy, it's getting quieter and quieter. See, we like to put God, he's got, to, all right, I'll give him this much space and I'll let him that much leeway. He gets out of that. I don't know about that. This is what they said to Jesus. Didn't the crowd one day say to him, boy, we have, we've never seen anything like this. We've never seen things like this before. Well, I want to tell you something. It ought to be still happening today. We ought to be seeing things like we've never seen before. <laughs> I'm telling you, I'm trying to get over here. Look at Psalms 100. Psalms 100. You know, one thing the Lord or the devil will try to do is he don't, he hates worship. He hates true worship. Oh, he hates it. Hates it with a passion. Pharisees hated true worship. Pharisees like to, they love their programming. They would put it in a bulletin and program it to death and you didn't move out of it. It was, you know, you sing your two songs and, you know, do this, do that. Just stand up, sit down, and you just, we almost, you know, you feel like a robot. I want to tell you, uh, we don't want to ever program God in this church. Let God, we start out with a standard, but let God have his freedom. Are you hearing what I'm saying? You see, they try to block the real worship of God. Satan hates that. Look at Psalms 100 here. and You know, make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. I'm, I'm glad he said the word noise because when I sing, it sounds like noise, but he's all right with that, amen? Serve, <laughs> look, look at it, read with me verse two here. Serve the Lord how? With gladness. You know, we, you know Christians ought to serve God with gladness. They shouldn't be like the supermarket Christian. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? 
Well, how are you doing today? You know, they go to church. How are you doing today? Well, pray for me. I got a bunion on my big toe and this and that. And they give you the grocery list. You know how it goes. I mean, up and down, one side, down the other. And then at the end, you know, they got to get spiritual at the end. And all of a sudden they say, well, uh, pray for me that I hold out to the end. We ought to be serving God with gladness. Huh? Bunion and all ought to be happy serving God. Huh? Come on. I mean, serve him with gladness. You know, it's amazing. You know it. When you walk into a store and you've got a smile on your face, people almost pass out today. <laughs> Don't tell Brother McClary. No, I'm telling the truth. You, you know it. You're experiencing it. Walk in, Lacey and I. Oh, where was I? I forget where we was at. Just recently. Oh, out there, I believe. In court, real Cornfield County. And we walked into a place and we were smiling. Now, it looked like the people almost was ready to pass out. They just glued on us like this. I mean, frowns, you know. And all of a sudden, they started to grin. I almost wanted to tell them, smile, honey. It'll be all right. Things are okay. And, I mean, the world's just beat down. You know, Christians should never walk into a store looking like they drank a gallon of persimmon juice and topped it with lemon. We ought to be, we ought to walk in there, I mean, with a glow about our lives. Why? We're serving the Lord with gladness. Why? We passed unto, through death unto life. We've been resurrected with Jesus. Well, the world's falling apart, but we're not. <laughs> the economy's gone down to two. Well, the kingdom's not. <laughs> I'm on a mission tonight. You're going to be happy when you leave here tonight. Serve the Lord with gladness. We're not Pharisees. Let's serve him with gladness. Why, weren't the, why wasn't the religion of the Pharisees happy? Because they were so full of the burdens. When we can, listen, this we learned this morning. This cross means what? I said this about Deborah and, and Brother McLean. I mean, it, it means freedom. I tell you, when that weight is gone, you can't help but react and get happy. <laughs> I mean, shoo. Didn't he say it? Didn't the Pharisees, they kept binding on more burdens. You got to do this. You got to do that. And binding on and binding on. But Jesus said, look, he said, you know, take my yoke upon you. Take it on. Why? Because my yoke is easy and my burden is light. It's freedom. <laughs> oh, where are we at? I, what verse are we in now? Oh, verse 2. Come before his presence with grumbling and complaining. Did your version say that? Come before his presence with what? Come singing unless you're going through a hard time. We don't live by what we see. We live by faith. Come before his presence with singing. Know ye that the Lord, he is God. It is he that hath made us and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Oh, here it comes. What is the first two words of the next verse? Let's all read it. First two words, ready? Enter into. Now, what does enter mean? <laughs> to enter into somewhere, you know it's not coming to you. You have to go to it. Right? If you entered into this church tonight, it didn't go to your house. You had to come here and go in. Right? And so enter in means what? You don't spectate. You have to participate. <laughs> where did God enter into where? Where? His gates. Now, he's referring back then, you know, the temple and so forth. But we're spiritually taking this in its application and just as real with it. Enter into where? His gates. Now, his gates, that's that temple and so forth. His presence, we're all in the same thread. And do it with, how do I enter in? With what? Thanksgiving. <laughs> and into his courts with praise. praise. Be thankful unto him and do what? Bless his name. Whew. Oh, we got to read the next verse and then we'll move on. But why, why do we got to do that? Why would we even want to do it? Because for the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting and his truth endureth to all generations. <laughs> I tell you what, people's going to be running the streets of Williamson tonight. I can see it. If you, listen. Did you take notice tonight? We were singing power, or, or there, there's power in that blood. Uh, when we were singing these other songs tonight and worship, did, did you take notice while you were singing? Did you take notice of something? You could have come in here with kind of feeling weighted. 
But isn't it interesting when you enter into worship, that while we are singing and praising God, you will notice that all of that little bit of stress just kind of leaves the life. <laughs> anxiety. Do you know why? Because anxiety cannot coexist simultaneously with a heart that is truly worshiping God. <laughs> Matter of fact, you can't worry and praise God at the same time. <clears throat> what did he just say? Now, listen, I, <laughs> Ethel, get with you, 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 you got to understand. The, the reason why times when we're not worshiping, let me just take it even further. And, and I'm going to come to the service in a minute. But I want to tell you, our lives should be lived as worship to God. Amen? Now, notice Psalm 34, 3 says, Oh, magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt his name together. Now, what does that mean when, you, when we're worshiping God? Well, let's say when we said, I exalt thee. You're high above all gods. What are we doing? We're magnifying him. Now, that doesn't mean God gets bigger. At that moment, he doesn't, in heaven, all of a sudden he fluffs up. He's not physically getting bigger. When we're magnifying the Lord, it simply means that our perspective of God gets bigger. When our perspective of God gets bigger, problems get smaller. <laughs> when problems are getting bigger, God is getting smaller in our perspective. You see, when we, because as we worship, he starts to fill up every area of our life. You see, our problems seem big because I'm facing it. He, you see, here's the thing. When problems get big, I'm trying to face it in my presence on my ability and power. What we need to do is take the problems into the presence of God and let it go. Are you hearing me? Bring the problem into God's presence, and then you'll, and then you'll hear these words from Ephesians 3.20, Now unto him that is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. How many would agree with me that verse is true? He is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that you can ask or even think about. Can somebody say amen? amen. <clears throat> now, when you hear all of this, boy, I God has been dealing with us as a church and myself and I mean as a person and individual as well. So I'm not up here loftily out over you. This is to all of us and me included. We've been talking about this. I'm telling you, the Lord is really trying to take this church into a deeper experience. The reason why church is not working for a lot of people is because most, listen to this, this, this is a fact. Most people come to church the exact same way they go to a ball game. Well, all right, I'll, they'll go to, they'll go to, I think Ford's Theater popped in my mind. They go to, they go to church the same way they'd go to Ford's Theater in Washington, D.C. They, they come to watch others perform. And, and listen, when you're at a ball game and when, or, or you're at a theater, you will receive temporary joy from watching other people. However, it's not going to work for you. Are you here tonight? See, joy from watching others does me no good. Oh, I feel a little different for about 20 minutes, hour, maybe the rest of the evening. <laughs> but I'll wake up tomorrow morning and I will not have the effect like the person who actually did worship. Okay? You see, once I experience something for myself, other people's opinions will never matter. See, when you really sell out to God even, when you sell out to God and when people make fun of you, their opinions don't matter now because why? When you experience it, nobody can take that away. Well, I've tasted it for myself. I know what it tastes like. 
If I leave church, and I'm even talking about Mount Calvary, if I leave church the same way I come in, it's because I did not participate. The Bible says in Psalms 100, he said, enter into, and then things will change. <laughs> oh, help us, Lord, help us, help us. Too many Christians are moody. Oh, I didn't think I'd get an amen. <laughs> I'll say it down here. A lot of Christians are moody. Amen. Am I telling the truth? Amen. They're moody, temperamental. Hmm. They're stressed. Do you know why? Because they're not participating. You know, what do you mean? What do you mean? What do you mean? What are you talking about? Because you know why people's moody is because they they have to be in control of everything, and when something gets out, oh, they're stressed. <laughs> do, do you know people who talk the loudest usually are the most immature on the inside? The biggest mouth on the job really isn't the biggest tough guy. Now, you force me into it, I'm going to tell that story one more time. And you, uh, you know that truck driver, remember that? Remember that? I tell you, I worked with a guy one time, had the biggest mouth you ever went. I mean, on the job, he was hoorah. I mean, he just hoorah. I mean, he was macho. Oh, I tell you, he ordered everybody around. Big mouth, boy, cussed. And I mean, he was just something. <laughs> and I thought, my, he is a man's man. I mean, he's a macho. I mean, this guy is something. Until I saw him in a supermarket one night with his wife. <laughs> huh? And and I, I saw him, and I, he he saw me, and he didn't even want to say. I mean, I worked with him, for him and he he just I just looked like I didn't even look like the same guy. Head down, there she was. He just and I said, I hollered. I almost said his name. I hollered. I said his name. I said, Hey! I, and I got loud. I thought, Oh, he's the same loud, big mouth he is on the. I said, How are you doing? Oh, I'm all right, Ruben. I almost said to him, what's wrong with you, boy? I mean, come on here. And I can tell, I mean, he was a whip pup. And I thought, isn't that something? That here is a guy, because he's so insecure, he's got he's to feel it somewhere, so he's on the job and he does. Let me tell you, always, the big mouth is not always the most secure person. And there's reasons for that. But as a Christian, we shouldn't live like that. We should be authentic wherever we are, amen? We, listen, we don't live in fear. Christ obliterated that. And the reason why somebody is moody and temperamental and always stressed as a Christian is because they've never learned to truly participate. Oh, they're good at spectating, good at applause, amen, whatever the case, good at singing, but they've never entered in. Just singing a song is not worship. Worship is when the life lays itself down before God and it adores the matchless power of the person of Christ. It is authentic. That person never learned to participate. It never learns to worship. It's never learned to praise. It's never learned to believe. It never, it never participated by getting into his presence. It, it never participated. It simply spectates. God doesn't want spectators. He wants everybody on the field of life. He wants everybody getting involved. He wants everybody worshiping God for themselves. I tell you what, I even, you know, this, think about this. Why would anybody take the time to invest in getting ready to go to church, putting on their best cologne, perfume, doing their hair, putting makeup on, the guy combing his hair, putting on his best shoes and suit and dress, whatever he got, and come to the house of God and not participate? I tell you what, I'd want to receive the benefits of the house, but we have to enter in. I'm trying to find a caboose. I'm getting long-winded here today. And nobody likes a long-winded preacher, but today you'll have to endure. <laughs> this morning we ran out of time back here, and I think we're about ready to run out again, but, but it just, I, I've got to just, just indulge me just a little bit. Uh, just this last uh, little illustration here. We, we enter in. We, we put, uh, well, I'll use Harold Butch again. I wear these two guys out, I think. But Brother Butch, just, you just, stand, just stand right here and face back th towards me. Just stand right there if you would. And, and, and Brother Harold, uh, you stand back in this aisle. Just stand right here, and then you face me too. Just, just stand back in that aisle, and then you, you face me there. All right, now. 
you know, I like to physically demonstrate what happens in the spiritual side. <clears throat> Brother Butch, again, we, we've always got him as Jesus. All right, she didn't say amen to that, so you're, but, but we got him as Jesus. I, as a Christian, now we're going to, let's don't make him the devil. We've had him the devil and everything else. <laughs> Let's just say he's an instrument used by the devil. Is that going to work on it? There it is. All right. That's not as bad. Uh, all right. But anyhow, I couldn't take my eyes off his head. I, I'm, <laughs> but <laughs> the Bible says what? I am to, where am I to look? <laughs> Jesus, to the author and finisher. I mean, that's the only thing. He is the person. He's the only thing I'm to look at is him. All right. Now, as long as I'm looking at Christ, what is the devil going to do? He's, he's going to try to distract us. And I'm not going to tell him to do this, but let's pretend Harold is Jesus now is his word. Let me just get this out. The word of God is being spoken, the Holy Spirit using, and Christ is the word. And he's speaking the word. When I'm looking at Christ, I should be hearing the word of God. Right? So now here comes the devil using, let's call him Jimmy. We don't let him say Harold. When we get it. And, and so he's using him. And now there comes other voices in our lives, other distractions. Now he's talking to me and he's talking to me. However, as they're both talking, if you know it, where you're looking and concentrating, who are you going to hear? The one you're focusing on. Am I right? What does he become? Now, I, I can't stop him from talking. Nobody else can either, but he's, he's talking. Nobody's gonna, that's going to affect of life. Satan's going to do something to try to distract. I'm looking at Christ. <laughs> he's talking to me. I'm talking about, but, but he's talking. I can focus. I'm hearing him. However, as long as I'm focused on Christ, all that he's saying and doing becomes what we call background noise. I'm not paying attention to that. But do you know what happens is, and here's the fatal mistake, is when I start getting a little distant from Christ and I start looking towards him, now what happens is Christ and his word starts to become background noise and now this takes center stage. Now I'm starting to listen to the distraction. Now I'm starting listening to a foreign voice. Remember we learned this. Uh, where it was in Adam and Eve. And remember with the, the ladies and so forth and the husbands and the wives. And, and she, you know, she was, she was to listen to her husband. Remember that? Remember in Ephesians? She, she's to be subject to her husband. Not as somebody else's husband, her husband. Remember we brought that in. And, and what happened was when Eve started listening to a foreign voice, that's when the family got in trouble. All right, we're the church. I know we don't like to say this as men, but we are a part of the bride. All right, who is our husband? Jesus Christ. And so when he talks, we're to be subject to him. We are not to listen to a foreign voice. And what happens is when we listen to a foreign voice like Eve, we get into trouble. And like Eve, usually it's just not one person going down. You drag other people with you. Are you still in this little building tonight? So our main point is we need to stay focused hearing thus saith the Lord. And you're not going to stop the devil with all his noise, but keep it in the background. Don't focus on that. Don't pay it much to attention. Just pay attention to Christ. And you know what will happen? You'll pass on through it and you'll get through it to another time. There'll be other noise, but this will pass and you'll move on and grow up. Amen? And keep growing and grow up some more, grow up some more. And, and the problem is a lot of times we get so distracted, we're always vacillating back and forth. Oh, we're here for a while. Then we get weak. Then we vote. Then we get strong. Then we get weak. We're not to be vacillating back and forth or oscillating back and forth. We're not to be like a rocking chair. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you're here and then you're back. Then you're here. And the problem is in a rocking chair, a lot of movement, not going anywhere. Huh? Or going backwards. And that happens too, doesn't you? When you get to rock and boy, backwards you go. You got to be careful of that. 
So when we come into worship, guess what we should be doing? Participating by ignoring this, focusing on him in the risen Christ. When we worship him, guess what happens? All of this gets smaller and smaller. It will even get quieter and quieter. Can somebody say amen? Yeah. Thank you, fellas. Thank you. Praise God. I, I, I'm <laughs> you see... I can tell, I can tell in myself what I'm doing by what's being caused. If I'm looking at Jesus Christ, what is caused, the, the reaction in my life is peace. If I'm not having peace but stress, I'm not focused on Christ, I'm focused on something else. Whatever I look at has the power to create emotion has the power to create stress or peace. Only Christ can produce peace. Amen? So if you've got trouble in your life tonight, you feel stressed. Well, we're not here to beat you over the head. We just offered you. There's a way out of that. There's a way to quiet the voice. You know, we read these verses, but do we really read them? And I speak for myself. You know, the Bible said at Romans 8, you know, it went 28. And he said, you know, all things work together for good. If we really believed that, we would never worry another day in our life. <laughs> Isn't that what he said? He said, all, he works all things, all things work together for good. Now, he didn't say to the world, he did say to you. That is a special promise that comes through this cross of the blood of Calvary. And what that promise is, is only to those who love God. Do you love him? Well, then that's for you. And then he said, who are called according to his purpose. Well, that's you. I don't know about you, but let's focus on Jesus tonight. Amen. Aren't you glad you were in the house of God today? Whoo, glory to God. My, I'm excited. And you are too. Amen. Let's stand this evening. Praise God. <clears throat>